What a delight it is to be back at First Baptist Church in Indian Trail. I love your pastor, Brother Mike, and he's so gracious to let me come. And you know, I, I really am grateful because when a pastor trusts you with this pulpit when he's not there, that's a very high compliment. And I thank you, Brother Mike, and just uh, always come. I tell him every time he invites me. Now, you can go watch all the tapes where I preach, and you see, I don't say this everywhere I go, but I tell him, Brother Mike, thank you for letting me come and be in your pulpit and to preach in what I think is one of the greatest churches in America. And uh, you can applaud to that. That's true. You can. That's the truth. And what a joy it is to be here, and thank you uh, for the opportunity. When Brother Mike asked me to come, he asked me if I would consider, pray about, uh, doing, recreating something that I did a couple of years ago when I was here on a Monday night. And I tend not to try to rehash sermons when I go somewhere, but I also know the sheep knows the shepherd better than I do. And I want to be submissive to the will of God and to your pastor. And so I want to share with you this morning a message that I shared then. And if you heard it, you just go to your happy place and um, make out your Christmas list, whatever you need to do. But I believe, as was evident earlier, that many of you are going to be encouraged by what I'm going to share this morning. I want to talk to you today about reaching your prodigal. Luke chapter 15 is the story of the prodigal son. And we won't read all of the story because most of you are probably familiar with this story, but let's pick up in verse 17 of Luke chapter 15 where Jesus is speaking and he says, and when he came to himself, he said, how many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare and I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. Now just note in your Bible, those two words make me because they stand in contrast to the two words in verse 12 when he said to the same father, give me. But he said, make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. And when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Several years ago, I was invited to speak into a church where I did not know the preacher very well. We had mutual friends and through those friendships, he invited me to be a guest preacher in their church. And that Sunday morning I preached and we concluded the service and the pastor and his wife and I went to a nearby restaurant and we sat down to eat and we were getting to know each other and we naturally began to talk about our families. And the pastor and his wife told me that they had five sons, all adults, all living away from home. And over the course of our meal, they told me about four of their sons how they were active in church, doing the Lord's work. And, but I noticed there was one son that was never mentioned. Now, at first, I didn't think much about it until the pastor's wife wrote me a letter a few weeks later and said, Brother Phil, I think I need to explain why we omitted our fourth son from the conversation. She said, because like the others, he grew up in church, he went to the same schools, same family, and of all of our sons, he was the one who seemed to enjoy church the most. In fact, she said, if I had to pick which of our five sons would have followed their father in ministry, I would have picked our fourth son. But shortly after he graduated from high school and began attending college, we discovered he was doing some things that broke our heart. And one day he came home and told us that he had decided to quit college and he was going to get married. And the young girl he was marrying, we suspected, was already expecting their first child. Well, the child was born after they married and all seemed well. And then she said our son began having an affair with a woman where he worked. And before long, that re he left his wife and moved in with her, but that relationship didn't last long, and then there was another and another. And she said, today he is far from the Lord, and we still have communication with him, but when we talk to him, he makes it clear that we are not to discuss church or God or spiritual things. And then she said in her letter, Brother Phil, I'm really asking, writing to ask you two questions. 
Number one, what did we do wrong? How can you have five boys experience the same things, four serve God, and one becomes a prodigal? And she said, and number two, what can we do now to get our son into a right relationship with his heavenly father? Well, when I read her letter and those two questions, that wasn't the first time I had heard them. As a traveling preacher, there is rarely a week that passes that I don't hear those two questions. Someone sharing about their son or daughter or grandchild who has walked away and they began to wonder, what did I do wrong as a parent, as a grandparent, and what can I do now? So I decided I would try to help those people. So I began to search the scriptures. I studied everything I could find about wayward children and prodigal children, and I read everything I could find. And I have to tell you, initially, I did not find the answers that I was seeking. And so I became a bit flustered. And finally, unable to really come at peace with those two questions, I just said, well, this is not for me, so I pushed it away. But if you're a Christian, you understand when I tell you the Holy Spirit has a way of pushing things back. And so it became a consuming burden in my life. I had to know the answer to those two questions. But the more I researched, the more flustered I became. And finally, I preached one night in Missouri, a church where I'd never been before, and I didn't know anyone, and I didn't even reference prodigals in my sermon. But at the conclusion of the service, this lady, who I did not know, came to me, and she said, may I speak a word with you? And we were at the front of the auditorium, so we kind of stepped off to the side from the crowd, and she said, I just feel so impressed of God to tell you about my daughter, who was a prodigal. And then she said, while you were preaching, God told me to come ask you two questions. <laughs> what did I do wrong? What can I do now? Well, I said a few encouraging words and we prayed together. And, but I remember going back to the hotel room that night and I pulled my jacket and threw it across the chair. And I fell across the bed and I said, Lord, something's got to give. I said, I have this burden for reaching prodigals and helping parents with wayward children, yet I can't seem to find the answers I'm seeking. So I said, Lord, I want you to do one of two things. Either completely remove this burden from my heart or I want you to give me insight into these two questions. And I said, and Lord, while you're deciding what you're going to do, I'm going to bed. And I went to bed. <laughs> and I went to sleep. And around two in the morning, it was though someone walked into the room and flipped on the lights. I jumped out of bed, I got a piece of paper, and I started writing. Not ideas, not thoughts, but names. Names of people that I knew well who were prodigals or people who were prodigals who recently got right with God. I wrote a name, another name, until I had written 30 names. And after that, I don't think I could have written my own name, to be honest. And when I looked at the list, coincidentally, there were 15 who were still prodigals and 15 were prodigals who had recently gotten right with God. Now, I have to tell you, on that list, Every kind of prodigal you can imagine was represented. There were one or two who were good moral kids. They weren't interested in spiritual things. To one who was incarcerated for a serious felony. And every kind of addiction you can imagine was on that list. Well, when I returned home from that trip, I contacted all 30 of the prodigals. And I said, will you let me interview you? I won't preach, I won't comment, I just want to listen, and all I ask in return is for your honesty. And as I listened to their stories, suddenly everything I read in scripture about wayward and prodigal children came into focus. And so what I want to share with you this morning is what came out of that experience, particularly from the story of the prodigal wayward son in Luke 15, and share with you what I call the six principles for getting your son or your daughter back to God. Principle number one is the one you can start practicing today. You need to learn to live guilt-free in your Christian life. You see, when people ask, what did I do wrong? They're really saying, I feel guilty. 
I failed as a parent. Apparently, I made some decisions that affected my child in a negative way, so their waywardness is my fault, and I feel guilty. And if you're sitting here today and you have a wayward son or daughter, you know exactly what I'm talking about. So here's what you do. You've gone back to the moment they were born, to the present moment, and you have analyzed every decision that affected their life. You are searching for a reason for their sinfulness. So you find yourself thinking, well, if we had put them in a different school, maybe if we had gone to a different church, maybe if I had taken that job and we had moved to a different town, maybe if I had prevented them from hanging out with those kids, so you spend your time analyzing everything that happened to them in the hopes that maybe, maybe you can find the reason why you failed as a parent. Well, this morning, I'm going to answer the question for you once and for all, what you did wrong. And the answer is probably going to surprise you. I've done the research. I can answer that question authoritatively this morning. And I'm going to answer it for you in a moment. But first, let me ask you another question. Why do you, as a parent, feel guilty for the decisions of your children when they're adults? Well, I think there's two reasons. Number one is because we forget something that applies to our children. We apply it to others, but... For some reason, we never think of our kids in light of this biblical truth. Here's the truth. All of us are sinners. All of us are bent toward sin. All of us, if we do what is natural for us to do, would walk away. So if you have a child who has made poor decisions and they've walked away, can I tell you, they are doing what is natural for them to do. You see, in that pastor's home of five boys, the question really isn't why is one a prodigal? The real question is why are four serving God? Because that's the miracle. A prodigal is just doing what is natural for him to do. But there's another reason for our guilt and it comes from a misunderstanding of a passage of Scripture. It's one of the few passages that people can quote, but nobody can tell you where it's found. People will say, well, what about that verse that says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he will not depart from it. Now, that's in the Bible. It's Proverbs 22, 6. You don't have to turn there. You can trust me. It's there. But the, the Scripture is, well, that says, if I do it right, my kids always turn out right. Well, can I tell you that you cannot find three competent Hebrew scholars who will tell you that verse refers to parenting skills. Instead, it is believed by the context of the words to mean that if you have a child who has an interest in a subject, if you train them in that interest, they will pursue it for the rest of their life. For example, if you have a child who loves music, and you train them musically, they will love music all of their life. But you cannot find any competent Hebrew scholars who will tell you that it is referring to parenting skills. But we still feel guilty. So let me once and for all answer the question for you this morning. If you have prodigal children, what you did wrong? I've done the research. Here's the answer. You probably did nothing wrong. You can make every right decision and still have a child who walks away. Now, I know there's always people who want to come to you at the close of the service, and they, they want to debate that. They'll say, well, and usually it's people who don't have any children, I should tell you. And they come to you and they say, well, I just believe if you do it right, your kids always turn out right. And I look at them as I will look at you and I will say, if that's the case, then you need to explain something to me. If you believe that if you do it right, it guarantees your kids turn out right, then would you please tell me what God did wrong with Adam and Eve? Perfect kids in a perfect environment and a perfect father. And they walked away. You have imperfect kids this is an imperfect world, 
and you're not a perfect parent, why do you think you can do something God can't do? So you see the devil comes and he starts telling you it's your fault. You're to blame and you feel guilty. So you don't want to sing in the choir. You don't want to teach a class. You don't want to even come to church because obviously you blew it and you feel so guilty. Now, let me also tell you, and I don't have time to elaborate on it, but when you feel guilty, it allows your prodigal to manipulate you. So here's what you must decide this morning. Until the Holy Spirit shows me what I did wrong, I will assume I did nothing wrong and I will walk in victory and not in guilt anymore. And when you can learn to live guilt free, then you are in a position to help your prodigal instead of hurting your prodigal. Which brings me to the second point or the second principle. Because you see, there are people who will say, well, but I know what I did wrong. I know what I said to my kid. Well, in that case, then you need to ask for forgiveness. You need to go to your prodigal and acknowledge what you did wrong and say, will you forgive me? Now, I need to tell you, because I've done the research, they may not forgive you. And you need to be prepared for that rejection. When I wrote the book on this subject that we have some available when we finish today, but uh, on reaching your prodigal, I go into details about what to say and not to say and what to watch for when you ask for forgiveness of your prodigal. But when you do, here's what happens. You remove the barrier from their excuses. They no longer can blame you because you've acknowledged the wrong and asked for forgiveness when God reveals it to you. But here's the third principle. You also must love your child unconditionally. Well, I do. Well, can I challenge that? Do you have a child today that you hope I never find out belongs to you? (laughs) Do you have a child you find at night wishing had never been born? Do you at times find yourself thinking, I wish my child was like that child? then I could be proud of them. Well, those thoughts prove you don't have unconditional love because follow me, unconditional love is not based on performance. Unconditional love is based on who you are. So it doesn't matter if your child is the best kid in town or the worst kid in town, your love is the same because love cannot be conditional to be impactful. Unconditional love says, no matter what you do, I love you the same. Now, as a parent, let me help you. You have to set unconditional love as your response when things happen. Because if you don't, then you can make mistakes. Let me give you an illustration today, two illustrations, actually, of two men who faced a similar situation. Let me show you how they reacted and see if you can identify with which man man, uh, responded with unconditional love. The first is a man you would call a pillow member of the church. He was involved in a church near where I lived. He had been a deacon, Sunday school teacher, the church treasurer. He sang in the choir, highly respected man in the community. And one day his teenage daughter comes home and says, Dad, Mom won't tell you. I must tell you, but I'm going to have a baby. And of course, she wasn't married. And the father looked at her and said, How could you? Don't you know my reputation, our family's reputation? How could you do this? And he became angry. And in his anger, he began to pound on a coffee desk, a uh, coffee table. And he just looked at her and said, How could you do this to us? And in his anger, he said, I want you to go in your room. You get your things. You get out of my house. I never want to see you again. I never want to see you, this child. And as far as I'm concerned, you and this child from this day forward are dead. And she left and he bragged about what he did because he put his foot down. He took a stand against sin in his house. About six months later on a Sunday evening in the church that man attended, on a Sunday evening, the pastor went to the pulpit and began to weep. And he said, you're going to hear something in a few days, but I want you to hear it from me rather than someone else. We have learned this week that our 
daughter is going to be an unwed mother. He said, we've cried a lot. We're embarrassed. But I want you to know that my wife and I love our daughter. And we have committed to her that we will help her through this. We will help her rear the child if necessary. While we don't approve, we love our daughter. And he said, if I need to step down as your pastor, I will. I'll do whatever is necessary. But I want you to know that while we are ashamed of what our daughter has done, we are not ashamed. She's our daughter. And in front of the congregation, went over to her and said, I love you. Now, I'd like to ask you, which of those two daughters do you think is in church serving God today? Mm -hmm. It's the one who experienced unconditional love. You say, but wait, Phil, uh, if you give that kind of love, aren't you approving their sin? Hey, did God approve your sin when he gave you unconditional love? The truth is, it's not confirming or endorsing or proving the sin. But unconditional love says, I love you for who you are, not for what you do. Now, with that said, let me hasten to the fourth principle. Because this is where people get confused. They think unconditional love means every time my child has a problem, I rescue them. No, it's actually the opposite. So the fourth principle is you must let sin run its course. You must let them face the consequences of their decisions. You see, unconditional love says, I love you so much, I'm not going to get you out of jail anymore. I'm going to let you face the consequences of your decision. Unconditional love says, I'm not going to pay the gambling debts anymore because I love you so much, I'm going to let you face the consequences of your decisions. Go back to the story of the prodigal son. The father could have sent a servant with money. He could have sent him a soup and some soup and sandwich. Think about it. It would have gotten him out of the pig pen, saved the family the embarrassment, but it wouldn't have gotten him home. The father had enough wisdom to let his son face the consequences of his choices so that conviction could come and he would come to himself and back to his heavenly father. Now, let me tell you, Again, you love unconditionally. Unconditional love goes to see them every day in the jail, but it doesn't get them out of jail. Now, I believe you can extend grace the first time, and I think there are kids who learn their lesson. But when behavior is repeated, they must face the consequences of their choices. And that means you have to be bold and tough, but only because if you keep rescuing them, they're going to keep going to another hog pen. Now, with that said, let me give you the fifth principle. You must also guard your words. Watch what you say. One prodigal expressed it best. <laughs> he looked at me and he said, I don't understand my mama. He said, she comes home from church telling me how sorry her preacher is, how she don't like the music at her church, and she don't like nobody in her Sunday school class, and she spends all week talking about all the hypocrites in the church, and then next Sunday she's shocked when I don't want to go to church with her. <laughs> now you think about it. Sometimes we take all of our feelings and our problems and the devil magnifies them in the ears of our prodigals when we are critical. Sometimes when I talk to prodigals and they tell me all the hypocrites in the church, I'm discovering most of them get their information from their parents. And if you tear down all the people around your prodigal, the very one God may be using to get their attention is the one you verbally destroy. So you have to guard your words. And then here's the sixth principle. You must also pray for your prodigal. Well, Brother Phil, I do. Well, let me help you with that. When I did the research on prodigals who came back to the Lord, there were two things I noticed God consistently used. One was a friend someone who stepped into their life who began to nudge them back to the Lord. It might be someone who coached softball with them. It might be a next door neighbor. It might be a coworker. It might be someone who's on a committee at the school. But someone stepped into their life. There was a friendship formed, but that person has a heart for God. And through the friendship, they nudge them back to the Lord. So the first thing you pray is, Lord, bring into the life of my prodigal people who have a heart for you. Then here's the second thing I discovered. 
I discovered it is often the sickness and death of a parent or grandparent that gets the attention of a prodigal. So the next thing you pray is, Lord, I want you to do whatever it takes, even if I must be sick and die, to get the attention of my child. Now, that's a tough prayer. And I can tell you, if you can pray that prayer and mean it, all the other stuff is easy. But it's a tough prayer. Because we often pray, Lord, you know, change my prodigal. And God wants to say, before I can change your prodigal, I need to change you. And he wants us to be willing to do what is necessary to get their attention. In our office a few years ago, uh, I remember one of our uh, employees suggested that we take, on Wednesdays, that we all take our lunch break and we all bring our lunch and then we just allow each person for each Wednesday to share their personal testimony. Well, I knew everyone's testimony, but I realized that they hadn't shared it with each other, so I thought that was a good idea. So one of our staff took the time to sign everyone a Wednesday. Some weeks I was out of town, some weeks I was in town. There was a Wednesday approaching that I was to be in town, but I knew it would be very, very difficult for that employee to share if I was there because she is related to me. I don't know if you know this or not, but it's tough to give you testimony in front of your relatives that's known you all your life. And I knew it'd be real difficult for her because I remember when she was born, I've known her all of her life. And I also knew how she became a Christian early, wandered away from the Lord. And I knew it'd be tough for her to share, but I didn't know what to do. And so I, in my quiet time, I prayed and I said, Lord, you just need to tell me what to do. And my wife called me and said, we've got a luncheon we need to go to Wednesday. And I said, well, that's a word from the Lord. Tell him we'll be at the luncheon. So I went into Marla's office, the employee who's related to me. Her grandfather was my mother's oldest brother. Her grandfather was my uncle. And I remember I said, I said, I'm not going to be here tomorrow because I've got to go to this luncheon. And I don't think I could have told her that she had won the Publishers Clearinghouse Sweetstakes and she had been any happier. She looked at me and she said, whew, I'm so glad. I've been praying all late week. You'd be so sick tomorrow you couldn't come to work. And I, well, that was a blessing. I said, well, you don't have to pray that. And so I remember the next day I went to the luncheon and when I came back to the church or, or to our office, when I came back, I slipped into the young man who was an intern with us, and I said, how did Marla do? Oh, she did great. Told the story how as a young girl, she became a Christian in college. She wandered away from the Lord, became a prodigal. And then she shared how it was her grandfather, my uncle, who got her attention, his sickness and his death. It caused her to evaluate her life, and she got her heart right with God. She wrote her grandfather a letter. Her father read it to him on his deathbed, so he knew before he died that she had gotten her heart right with God. But when I heard that, it meant something with me. Because you see, her grandfather had been to my office several times to pray for his grandkids. And on one of those occasions, I remember he prayed, Lord, whatever it takes, I want you to do it. I remember sometimes later, he was diagnosed with terminal cancer. Fought it for two and a half months. And died. And when I left the office that day, I took a moment in my car and I said, Lord, thank you. Thank you for my uncle's willingness to do whatever it, it, would, it, it took. Just thank you for that. But I said, Lord, I wish he could be here. I wish he could see the impact of his death. I wish he could see how she's serving you and how her husband became a Christian and they're active in the church. I wish he could see that. And I remember as I sat there that day, I got an idea. I had never done this before. I, I, I mean, I know we can't talk to the dead. I know that. But it occurred to me, I can talk to the one who's with the dead. And I said, Lord, I want you to do me a favor. I said, if you're on the streets of heaven today and you see my uncle Bud, her grandfather, would you tell him for me that his death was not in vain? Would you tell him for me today how she stood and blessed your name? Would you tell him for me just tell him for me that his prodigal has come home. You see, I wish I could stand here today and give you a surefire formula. Boy, you check these off and your kid's going to be serving God. But I can't. Because you see, the prodigal chooses to walk away. They're the only one who can choose to return. 
What I've talked to you about today is removing all the barriers. So you're in a position of strength as a parent and a grandparent, but also to put you in a position that when the prodigal comes to themselves, and all prodigals eventually do, they know they can return home in many cases to their earthly parents, but to also know they can come to their heavenly father because there's no barriers there. But what if it is your sickness and death that gets your child's attention? You say, well, Phil, I, I won't get to see them get right with God. No, but wouldn't the next best thing being on the streets of heaven and the Son of God comes over and says, have I got news for you? The child that broke your heart, the prodigal you thought would never come home, they have come home and today they blessed my name. You see, prodigals do come home when you're willing to say whatever it takes, I'm willing to do it. Would you bow your heads with me, please? Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. In just a moment, we're going to stand and we're all going to sing a little familiar song, you'll know. But before we do, I want you to think about what I preached this morning. Because I have no doubt in an auditorium, in the balcony and the main floor, that there are many of you here today. And you have, in your life, you have a product your son, your daughter, or grandchild. As I said, maybe they're good moral kids. They're not in any kind of addictive or behavior, but they just don't have an interest in the things of God. Some of you are here and you have children that are making some very destructive decisions. Some of you, you feel the pain of a prodigal who won't even speak to you. Today, your heart hurts. And as I shared this morning, my prayer was that God would give you hope. And I'm wondering this morning, just a moment after I pray and we stand and begin to sing, I'm wondering this morning if you'd be willing just to step from where you are and you may just want to come and kneel, pray. There'll be staff here and others as well if you'd like for them to pray with you. But becoming publicly, you're just saying whatever it takes. It may just be you, or you may be here alone or single parent. You may want to come as a couple. But you're coming to say whatever it takes, I'm willing to do it. Would you be willing to do that? To say whatever it takes, that's what I want to do to see my prodigal come back to the Lord. Maybe you are the prodigal and you need to come and say to one of the staff members today, I need to get my heart right with God. You may want to come trust Christ today. You may want to join this church. You're welcome to do that as well. But if you're here today and there's a prodigal in your life, you want to say, God, I'm willing to say whatever it takes. I want you to step out from where you're standing and I want you to come. You may want to speak to a staff member. You may just want to kneel and pray. But I'm encouraging you to do it right now. Will you, Father, speak to hearts, give people the freedom to respond. And I'm going to thank you and I'm going to praise you for it. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. We stand, we're singing, God is speaking. You come on right now, won't you?